It's a Wednesday evening in 1974 in the Brisbane suburb of Highgate Hill. A young mother, Barbara McCulkin, and her daughters, Vicky and Leanne, are led by two men to a bright orange Valiant Charger. They're driven to an unknown bush clearing where they're raped and killed. Their bodies are never found. For 43 years, it has been one of Queensland's most haunting unsolved crimes. But not anymore. We now know two of the most sadistic criminals Australia's ever seen. Vince Dempsey and Gary Shorty Dubois did it. They were separated from their mother. Dempsey took her off into the darkness. But for decades, O'Dempsey and Dubois lived their lives believing they'd never be caught. He said, they'll never catch me because I'll never find the bodies. They thought their secret was safe, but they were wrong. Because these two men broke the criminal code of silence. And these two police detectives were relentless in tracking down the truth. It was, oh my God, we're going to solve this. For those in the know back then, 40 years ago, behind the respectable facade, Brisbane was blighted with a dark underbelly of rampant organised crime, extensive police corruption and blatantly corrupt politicians. A lot has since changed, but not here at Dorchester Street in Highgate Hill. This tiny workers' cottage where the McCulkin family lived is still frozen in time much like its residents from 1974. Barbara McCulkin was 34. Her husband, Billy, was not just an abusive philanderer, but also a well-known crook. The couple had two young daughters, Leanne, 11, and Vicky, 13. She was lovely and her Photos in the paper don't do her justice, and she was hard-working, and she loved her children. Ellen Gilbert was a close friend who worked with Barbara at a milk bar. Barbara has done no wrong except being with her husband, Bill. Billy was a criminal. Yes, wasn't definitely. He? And in the course of that friendship, did you become aware that there were bad men that she knew? Oh, definitely, yes. Through Billy McCulkin, Barbara got to know Vince O'Dempsey, another crook with a fearsome reputation for extreme violence. What she probably didn't know was that as a teenager, he'd been diagnosed as a psychopath. He was a regular visitor at the McCulkin home. He was picking Barbara up that first time I saw him and Barbara came over to me and said that that was Vincent O'Dempsey. Did Barbara talk to you about Vince O'Dempsey's violent reputation? Yes, she said he was a very violent man and at one stage she told me that he was working on the Leslie Dam up on the Darling Downs and that he'd um, kill the man and put him under a slab in the, of the dam. Did she ever refer to knowing anything that might get her into trouble? Oh, I think Barbara knew a lot. In fact, Barbara knew too much about two nightclub fire bombings which happened 11 days apart in Brisbane. And what she knew would ultimately lead to her and her daughter's murders. The 25th of February, 1973. A blast echoes through Brisbane's Fortitude Valley as Torino's nightclub goes up in flames. We ran a petrol trail out the back. Uh, what we didn't realise that the time between lighting it and pouring the petrol around, the fumes had built up and it exploded. 
blew the whole shop front out onto the street, nearly blowing glass and stuff onto us. Peter Hall was one of a gang of crims hired to firebomb Torino's nightclub. An insurance job organised by Gary Shorty Dubois on Vince O'Dempsey's orders. Did you ever meet O'Dempsey? Oh yeah, met him on a few occasions. Well, how did he strike you? Scary. If you looked at his eyes, his eyes are coal black. And they really unnerve a person when you look into his eyes. What was the feeling in the group about the job that you did on the Torino? We were pretty uh, happy with the money and that. But their jubilation was short-lived because less than two weeks later, in March 1973, another firebombing rocked Brisbane. This time, 15 people were killed inside the Whiskey A Go Go nightclub. At the time, it was Australia's worst mass murder. Yeah, it was um, panic stations when we found out about the whiskey. Thought if they ever found out about Torino's, they would try and link us to that. So did you have any knowledge of the whiskey or go-go bombing? No, <laughs> it was two big different things. <laughs> the whiskey was full of people. There was no one in Torino's. Peter Hall swears he wasn't involved in the whiskey arson attack, but one of two men later convicted of the crime was an associate of Vince O'Dempsey and a close friend of Barbara McCulkin's husband, Billy. Do you think she knew something about the whiskey a go bombing? Yeah, I think she knew enough to get herself into trouble. Detective Sergeant Virginia Gray and Detective Inspector Mick Dowie of Queensland's Cold Case Unit believe at this point Barbara had to be silenced because she might have implicated Vince O'Dempsey and his thug sidekick Shorty Dubois in the Whiskey A Go Go mass murder. One of the motives I believe how it worked anyway now is that Barbara knew something, she has revealed what she knew, and albeit it could have been O'Dempsey or it could have been Dubois, we don't know. Nine months on from the Whiskey A Go Go murders, it's the 16th of January, 1974. It's Janine Gayton's 10th birthday and she's waiting for neighbours Vicky and Leanne McCulkin to come over for cake. Two men pull up in a bright orange charger and she watches them go into the McCulkin house. A few minutes later, Janine and her sister Janet cross the road to collect the McCulkin girls. That's Shorty and that's Vince. Janet at least recognised one man she knew as Vince, who had previously been at the address and was known to her. Um, the other man was um, referred to as Shorty. Vicky and Leanne spend the evening at their friend's birthday party and are home by around 10 p.m. Little do they know, they and their mother are about to be lured to their deaths. Barbara, Vicky and Leanne left the house that night um, in the company of O'Dempsey and Dubois and they've never been seen again. Coming up, a gang's code of silence finally broken. You lived by a code. You never gave anyone up to the police, no matter what. For the first time, the full story what really happened to the McCulkins? If the police hadn't come and given you a hard time, would you have ever come forward? I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that. That's next on 60 Minutes.
It's the 18th of January 1974. Two days after Barbara McCulkin and her daughters, Vicky and Leanne, were last seen. Her estranged husband, Billy, arrives to find the house empty. It's the first anyone knows Barbara and the girls are missing. There was indications that they had planned to leave, but in, for a very short period of time. The cats were locked in the house, um, the sewing machine was still on and the, and the machine was sort of engaged. And Barbara was so reassured they'd be coming back soon, she even left her wallet with money in it. Yep, yep, and apparently left the house in her fluffy slippers. Detective Sergeant Virginia Gray says Billy McCulkin almost immediately suspects his violent criminal associates, Vince O'Dempsey and Shorty Dubois. What was the evidence that pointed to them? He had information from the Gaten, one of the Gaten girls, that Shorty and Vince had been at the address the last time they were seen. He confronted O'Dempsey and Dubois, didn't he? He did. You don't know the girl across the road said you've seen them. If I find out that you guys have been involved in this, I'm going to blow your head off. Within days of Billy's threat, O'Dempsey and Dubois skip town and go into hiding. They're the prime suspects in the disappearance and presumed murder of the McCulkins. But it's not until six years later, in 1980, that there's a breakthrough. The pair are charged with three counts of murder, but with insufficient evidence to proceed, both men walk free. For the next 34 years, there was nothing. The police case stalled and was all but forgotten. Then in 2014, a tip-off to the Queensland Police Cold Case Unit hinted that O'Dempsey and Dubois might have confessed their involvement in the murders to trusted criminal associates. It did come down to actually getting people to reconsider their silence. And, and, and make the decision in their own mind to actually tell us what they knew. And back then you lived, you lived by a code. What was that code? You never gave anyone up to the police, no matter what. Peter Hall lived by that code of silence for more than 40 years. Then in 2014, he broke it. I still feel, um, which is a stupid thing to say, I still feel bad about uh, breaking the code. Why? It's, um, I don't know, it's something I can't explain. What would torment you most about the memory of what you knew? What happened to the two little girls, I think. Back in the 70s, Peter was in Shorty Dubois' gang. He says that just days after the McCulkins disappeared, Dubois made a shocking confession. He didn't seem the same after it had happened. Like, um, I had got an invite to go around there that night with him and declined. What did he say to you? He said, we're over there at uh, the McCulkins' residence, having a party, drinks, would I like to come over? I said, no, no, I'm not interested. And um, yeah, next morning, he wasn't at home at normal time. And um, when he did start to talk, I realised he wasn't the same person. He was affected by something? He was. We were sitting out there in the car and he's, he's come out with it. And he told us, virtually exactly what happened. Tricked into taking a late night drive with Vince O'Dempsey and Shorty Dubois, Barbara McCulkin and her daughters are tied up and taken to bushland.
They were separated from their mother. Dempsey took her off into the darkness. And um, Shorty said it seemed like it took forever, but he guessed he was strangling her because there was gurgling sounds. Then he came back down and he said to Shorty, you know, rape one of the girls. He raped the other one. And then, then he asked him to kill her. He couldn't do it, couldn't kill her. So he said. And he said, oh, Dempsey killed them both. Hall's evidence was the critical detail the cold case detectives needed. When he finally did tell us what had happened, he was, uh, you could just see, he was to so emotionally relieved, he, he just changed. And what's it like that moment, when you suddenly hear him starting to talk? It was, oh my God, we're gonna solve this. With Peter's help, the case against Shorty Dubois was solid. But without the remains of Barbara McCulkin and her daughters, detectives needed more to get O'Dempsey. They concentrated on his closest underworld contact. There was a young punk hanging around the most feared man in the underworld. It doesn't get any better than that. He mentored you? Yes, he did. So you were actually driving Vince O'Dempsey home one night to Warwick from the drug plantation? Yes, one afternoon, yes. For 20 years, Warren MacDonald had been Vince O'Dempsey's protégé in crime. They were both involved in a syndicate growing cannabis on a property west of Brisbane. It was during this time he recalled a disturbing conversation with Vince O'Dempsey. Uh, we were talking about security for the crop and we're driving along in my car and that's when the conversation really come out to light. How did it start? He said, oh, you need a notch on your gun. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you need to kill. You need to get some respect, you know. He said, when I was, on your, when I was your age, I had several notches on my gun. And so what did you say to that? Uh, I didn't say anything at today because it kept going on about the McCulkins. Oh, so he raised the McCulkins? Yes, he did. Just come straight out with it. He said that he killed the McCulkins and Shorty was nothing but a rapist. He said, they'll never catch me because I'll never find the bodies. Mm. Why did he tell Warren, a young 20-something man, that he'd murdered the McCulkins? I guess to inspire him to kill for himself. He saw him as an understudy. Mm. He considers himself to be highly intelligent and I think he likes to pass on his craft, so to speak. Warren had kept O'Dempsey's secret for almost 20 years. But in a deal with police, the understudy ratted on his criminal mentor. People just ain't no good. If the police hadn't come and given you a hard time, would you have ever come forward? I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that, but the answer is no, I wouldn't have come forward. Why didn't you? I would be murdered. My family would be murdered. They're trying to murder me now. You still think Vincent O'Dempsey wants you dead? Absolutely. Coming up, a stunning twist. Barbara McCulkin's own secret. Did she tell you about that? Yes. Who is this mystery woman? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's next on 60 Minutes. By breaking the code of silence and giving up their criminal mates, Peter Hall and Warren MacDonald gave cold case detectives the vital evidence needed to solve the brutal murders of Barbara McCulkin and her daughters, Vicky and Leanne. 
I mean, where does it rank in terms of your experience as a copper and the crimes you've seen? This was particularly horrendous because of the age of the two girls, because they were totally innocent in any type of motive that these fellows could have thought warranted what they did to Barbara. The girls were totally innocent of that. Late last year, Gary Shorty Dubois was found guilty of murder and rape. And on Friday, Vince O'Dempsey was also convicted of murder. But that's not where this story ends. In all this misery, there's a surprising twist. 43 years on, it still matters, doesn't it, to friends like oh, you? Oh, for sure, yes. Do you still feel the pain? Do you still think of Barbara? Yeah, I do. It's awful to think that, uh, you know, a good mother with lovely girls and whatnot had to go through all that. Ellen Gilbert was Barbara McCulkin's best friend and has always been haunted by what happened. But she's also been keeping a secret something Barbara confided in her just before she was killed. She had a secret, didn't she? Yes, she did. Did she tell you about that? Yes, it was only, only one day. She was very upset. And um, then she said that she had a little girl and that her parents wouldn't let her keep the baby or marry the father of the baby. Baby Jocelyn was Barbara McCulkin's first child. Born in 1957, she was given up for adoption. Have you ever met Jocelyn? No, I haven't, no. Would you like to? Yes, I would, <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. Jocelyn, meet Ellen. Hello, Ellen. It's <laughs> been a long time coming. It has. <laughs> You're not going to cry, eh? Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am too. <laughs> yeah. You realise you're the spitting image of your mum. <laughs> Jocelyn was 14 when she first found out she was adopted. It was 1972, just two years before her mother and half-sisters Vicky and Leanne disappeared. Was it ever explained to you why did she give you away? She was only 17, she didn't have a job, she didn't have a partner. I, I guess she thought I'd have a better chance at life, you know, if she gave me up. When Jocelyn finally went looking for her mum, she was given her maiden name, Barbara Ogden. But it was the early 90s and it was too late. On that certificate, it listed her three brothers. So I called Barry, who was the first one on the list. What did you ask? I said I was trying to trace Barbara Ogden, and um, there was this deathly silence on the end of the phone, and then he said that she was missing, presumed dead. Was that a shock to you? Oh, definitely. I mean, even though I hadn't gone searching for her till later in my life, uh, you still always thought about her. When I saw that photo, I thought, wow. That's got to be my mum, you know, just her face and a shape yeah. of her eyebrows and... Yeah. Jocelyn is the closest biological link to Barbara and police have taken a DNA sample from her in the hope that one day her family's remains are found. That is the most disappointing aspect uh, of this investigation for us. We went to great lengths to actually find the bodies and what we sincerely hope will happen now is if at some stage their location of their bodies has been revealed to someone who's kept quiet all this time, that they now see that they have been convicted and the threat has been removed. 
If you had the opportunity to look into the eyes of Shorty Dubois or O'Dempsey, what would you say to them? Hmm. I guess the main thing that I would say would be, could you at least have a, a shred of decency and, and at least tell us where you buried them so that we can have closure for everybody in the family? Jocelyn lives in hope. She never had the chance to know her mum or sisters. But she says by talking now, perhaps a dark chapter can finally end on a positive note. For 45 years I've kept all that to myself and uh, my mother gave me life so it was something that I could do for her in death, you know. Um, and just a way of saying thank you back to her, you know. Jocelyn, for four decades, there's been secrets. There's been secrets about the adoption, and there's been this dreadful secret about the murder of your mum and her two little girls. Yeah, you get very sick of secrets. Very sick of it. While O'Dempsey and Dubois are now in prison, the case will never fully be closed until the bodies of Barbara McColgan and her daughters, Vicky and Leanne, are found. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.